this. Uh, we should be releasing this on Sunday morning, Christmas morning. So I definitely want to say Merry Christmas to everybody. And um, I just um, pray that it's going to be an incredibly blessed day for you. And um, I'm going to do something kind of different this morning. I want to start out with a prayer. And um, then we'll kind of go on from there. So, happy birthday, Jesus. I don't know exactly the day you were born, but I'm glad we could pick a day. We could have a day just to tell you happy birthday and that we are incredibly grateful that you came. Lord, my prayer is that you will really just get me out of the way and somehow speak through me, Lord, to show your love and to show who you really are and to speak into the hearts of anyone who's watching this. I pray, Jesus, that for anyone who watches this video, they're going to feel your presence and that you know them and you know their name and you know their life, and you care about them. And I pray, Lord, that if nothing else, that this celebration today of your birthday is going to be a chance for you to let people know who you really are and how very much you love them. So I just put this in your hands, and please speak through me, and my weakness be strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have been working our way through Philippians, and, um, but today I'm going to do something a little bit different, and then we'll be going right back to our study in Philippians for the next Tea with Jesus next week. Um, I wanted to say that um, I'm incredibly blessed. I just can't tell you how much it means, and I'm incredibly blessed that Bill and I both have been with so many comments that have just really shared open hearts and been so loving and just so incredibly sweet to us and we really really appreciate it and we don't take that for granted and um, I'm we seem to be growing now um, as a channel and I just pray that that's going to give more and more people opportunities to be able to um, to just share the incredible reality of Jesus even just during my studies here and um, so I just wanted to say um, thank you for so many comments. I try to answer as many as I can. I get kind of overwhelmed, but I just wanted to tell you thank you and that we do love you and we really appreciate your willingness to be a part of our life. You know, it's a pretty amazing thing, especially because it's all over the world. Oh my goodness, it's amazing. All right, so we'll go back to Philippians next week for sure because we want to really continue in the fourth chapter. But for today... Um, I've been thinking a lot um, about um, my glasses have to come off so I can read my Bible. I've um, been thinking a lot about who is who is this Jesus, the this, someone who came to us. I I know Bill did a very wonderful study just two weeks ago talking about what it meant, what, what really happened when Jesus came, and um, I think I want to. Um, approach things in my own way in a little bit of a different way for this one on Christmas morning just talking about who is this Jesus that we're talking about not only the great and mighty God who laid his glory down to come for our sake and to die for us and to be raised again to give us victory over death and over sin and a chance to be forgiven and to be able to live eternally with him which is incredible but who is this Jesus that's willing to be with us right now, on this on this morning, on this day? I want to go to Luke 4. I'm going to start at verse 18. Um, this is actually a quote out of Isaiah. So Jesus is opening a scroll, and he's speaking in the synagogue. And um, he's, he opened up the, the scroll to Isaiah, and this is the words that he read out of Isaiah. And I know that if I keep turning these pages, there it is. Now, he was from Nazareth. Jesus, I mean, he'd grown up there. And uh, so, I'll just say in verse 16, and this will be leading up to my main verse in 18. 
So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And this starts in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, or the good news, to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And in verse 20 it says that, Then he closed the book and gave it to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That he was the fulfillment of that amazing scripture back in Isaiah. That he had come to give good news to the poor, to heal brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim that it's the acceptable year of the Lord. And this is what Jesus really came to do. And I pray that there are many, 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 many of you who are watching this that are spending time with family today, um, looking forward to kids opening gifts, hopefully getting a chance to go to a wonderful church service for Christmas morning, um, looking forward to seeing friends, to having really a wonderful day, probably eating too much, um, enjoying the gifts that you've put so much thought into preparing, enjoying the decorations. I just pray there's many, many of you that are just going to have a glorious day. But I also know that there's a lot of people out there who feel very alone this Christmas. Or Christmas reminds them of something that's really hard to remember. Or there's some reason why it just feels particularly kind of sad and you feel like it should be happy. But it doesn't necessarily feel that way. We are all in different situations, in different circumstances. And my heart's been really pondering and thinking about a lot of the people that um, are having a little bit of a sad or a tough Christmas for whatever reason. Find finances are really tough or there's been a loss that's hard to face and Christmas is kind of just a reminder because you remember so many Christmases with this person that you loved. Um, families that are struggling. There's so many different things. And um, I just pray that this Christmas, that you can find a touch from Jesus that will bring peace and a sense of hope and joy that will be very unexpected, but really wonderful. And so I want to share just a couple things out of Scripture about what Jesus was like when he was here on earth. And I know what he's like now in his heart and in his, how he feels about us and what he wants for us. Let's go to Mark 10, 13 through 16. You know, in that last scripture I ended, by the way, on verse 21, in case somebody didn't realize that, that it was Luke 4. Um, I started at 16, but officially 18 through 21. And now we're going to go to Mark 10, 13. And these same stories are told all through the different Gospels, all through you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But let's go to Matthew, um, excuse me, Matthew 19, 13. Oh, no, sorry, Mark 10, 13 through 16. I had put both references on there. Um, this is verse 13. And when it says him, it's talking about Jesus. And then they brought little children to him, that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. You know, don't bother the master. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me. 
do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, and he laid his hands on them, and blessed them. And that was verse 16. Jesus held the children, and he touched them and blessed them. And he was saying that if you can't become as a little child, you can't really enter into the kingdom of God. And I think what he really means by that is that we have to really recognize our need of the Father, that we need him, and that no matter how smart or educated or strong or tough we are, somewhere deep inside, we desperately need the Lord, and we need him to be our Father. We need Jesus in our life. And um, I love how he didn't let people keep the children away from him. But he loved them, and I think he laughed with them, and I think he made them very comfortable. And I love his tenderness toward the kids. Kids just melt and break my heart, and I'm so glad they seemed to have been very dear to Jesus, too. Let's go to John 8. This is a very familiar story. Um, the story starts in the first verse, but I'm not going to start reading there. I'll kind of just catch up the story. Um, Jesus had come into the temple, and people were all coming down. He was teaching them. And um, the scribes and Pharisees suddenly bring a woman to him that had been caught in adultery. I'm not sure where the man was, but they were bringing the woman to him. And they put her right in, in the midst. And they said, well, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And the law states that she should be stoned. What do you say? And I'm going to start at verse 6. And I am sure this was an incredibly terrified woman. I can't imagine dying by having stones thrown at you until you are so cut up and beaten that you die. It just I can't even imagine it. So starting in verse 6. It says, This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And that was to verse 12. This terrified woman was brought to him. She had been caught in sin, sin that was treated very seriously. And Jesus, in the very wisdom that incredible wisdom that he had and he would speak what the father told him to speak and this was an, an amazingly loving wise just thing for him to say to stand and say if you have no sin you be the first to throw a stone at her and actually the only one in that entire group that had not sinned was Jesus himself and the compassion that he showed her I can just see him just the woman's probably just like terrified on the ground and him just kind of lifting her up and raising her head and saying, Woman, where are your accusers? Isn't anyone condemning you? And this woman who knew she was about to die looked around. There was no one left to stone her. And she said, No one, Lord. And he said, Well, I don't condemn you either. 
go and sin no more. And you know, I think his love and his forgiveness went a long way toward that woman's life changing. And she probably didn't stay in the same life that she had been in. Jesus chose to forgive her because that is what he chooses to do. He says, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you're not going to be in darkness, but have the light of life. One thing I really appreciate about Jesus is that he truly is compassionate and just, but compassionate. And um, there's so many different situations and cultures and, and different belief systems that a lot of times have been very, very hard on women. And I really respect the fact and appreciate the fact that from everything we can ever see, Jesus was very respectful and honoring toward women. And um, I love the fact that he took this terrified human being and was able to show compassion and reassurance and probably, like I said, the love and forgiveness that she needed to probably change her life. And um, that touches me really a lot. Um, I want to go to Matthew 5. I'm going to read 43 and 44. This is called his Sermon on the Mount. He had tons and tons of people gathered all around. And he was like raised a little bit higher there up on the side. And he was teaching all these amazing things to the people. And so this is called the Sermon on the Mount. And what I think is neat about this scripture is that it's what he's asking us to do. And so therefore it is what he does. And it reflects his character. He says, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And um, what an incredible, incredible um, power to be able to show love when it's not deserved, and to forgive when it's not really forgivable, and to to bless those who want to curse us. It's trusting that God's going to somehow take care of us, and we can produce love when it doesn't seem possible, and that's only through His power in our life. Bill had a picture on our wall. I think I've mentioned this before. I'll say things more than once. But he had a picture on our wall for a long time, especially when we lived in Germany. And it had a, just a basic drawing of a flower just laying flat on the ground. And it said, love is the fragrance that a flower gives when it's stepped on. And I just love the fact that when people aren't handling things very well and they don't necessarily treat us very well, we can pray very, very hard for them. But we can respond, as Jesus said, blessing those who want to curse, doing good to those who are hating, praying for those who are using us badly and persecuting us because God's power God's love God's peace is strong enough in our lives that through he can work through us to be able to do that but that also reflects him and I just he, he came to a whole world when he was born he came to a whole world that was disobe disobedient and often cruel and cold and struggling and he was willing to come and be misunderstood and reviled that's a powerful word but he was willing to do that because he loved and he was fighting for his family and he was willing to die for those who maybe even would ultimately reject him but he wanted everyone to have a chance and so this scripture reflects his heart as well as what he wants from us he was willing to touch lepers which was unheard of to touch a leper, to heal them. He was willing to sit and eat with sinners and love them and give them hope that their life could change. I'm going to do one more um, scripture. I want to go to Mark 6. When I really look at what's going on in this story, it really does touch my heart. 
I'm going to start at verse 29. And to understand what's going on, um, we have to realize that um, the man called John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And uh, they had obviously known each other, you know, all of Jesus' life. And um, John had been preparing the way for Jesus to come. Um, and so, I, you know, I really think that Jesus very much cared about him. And, you know, he was family, and he cared about him. And um, John the Baptist had just been killed. And he'd been, he had been murdered, you know, executed, basically. Um, Herod and Herod's wife really wanted him dead. And so um, he had been killed. And um, starting in verse 29 in Mark 6, when his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Um, John the Baptist had been taken and buried. Then the, apostle, then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, and what they told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And so Jesus has just found out that his cousin has been killed. And he said to them, "Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while." There were many, for there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. And I think Jesus just needed a chance to regroup a little bit and mourn and grieve. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before him and came together to him. And Jesus was tired. They'd hardly had a chance to eat. And I think his heart was, was, was really grieving. Um, for for John, and I think he needed time, just with close friends, you know, the close friends, or just time with his father. But it says here in verse 34, and Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, "This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late." So send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But Jesus, he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you see? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, We have five loaves and two fish, which actually came from a little boy's lunch. And then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down literally in ranks, hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed, and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fish. And now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men, and then also their families. Jesus had such compassion on them. And even though he was exhausted and tired and grieving, he not only just shared truth from his Father's kingdom to them, but he saw they were hungry, and he made sure they had a chance to eat. And not only did they get to see a miracle, but Jesus really cared about the fact that they were hungry, and he wanted to make sure that they could get something to eat. And it was that night when he tried to send his disciples on ahead. I think he was still trying so hard to maybe have a little time to himself. He sent the multitude away, and his disciples got in the boat and went across the water. And then, in verse 46, when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. He finally had a chance to be with his father. And in verse 47, and now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. So, now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. When he went up to the boat to them, then he went up to the boat to them, he, oh my goodness. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and they just marveled. And so he came out walking on the water and calmed the sea. And um, 
I'll have to double check. That may have been the time when Peter came out and walked on the water until he got scared. And then he sank and Jesus raised him back up and said, have faith in me. And so no matter what's going on in his life, he's always reaching out to show love, to reassure and to care for, for the people that he loved so much. And um, he, he looked out over Jerusalem one time and was weeping. And he said, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, this, by the way, is in Luke 13, 34. You have stoned the prophets and, and got, just never believed people I've sent to you. I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. He just loved the people so much. And I'm going to make sure I'm going to take a second and actually read that instead of just paraphrasing it. And that will be, um, I think, the last scripture I'll share for this tea with Jesus. And he, he was weeping. He said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you are not willing. And I really think that the enemy just wants us to not even want to speak or hear the name of Jesus. He wants people to think that the Lord wants to bring rules and regulations and um, intolerance, but that's just not who Jesus was, and it's just not who Jesus is. I, um, I wish so much, I think I'm going to get a t-shirt that just says, God has been trying so hard to tell everybody that he's the good guy. That Jesus is the knight in shining armor and loving and strong enough to take care of us and cares about every detail of our lives. And um, I just pray that on this day that we celebrate his birthday that you can have a chance to find out more about what he's really like and that you can know that he's there with you. And if you don't know him, he wants you to accept the fact that He took those sins for you. That He took them all. And that He wants to be in your life. He wants you to belong to Him. He wants to be able to be there to care for you and to guide you and to just be with you. He died and rose again to be able to be with us. And that you could know Him. And for everyone who does, I just already know Him, I pray that this will be a day where His presence is going to be an incredible blessing and incredible joy. And let's just remember what an amazingly cool guy He really, really is and what His heart is really like and that He's not a fool and He's not weak. He's strong enough to live in the truth. He's strong enough to love when it seems impossible. He is strong enough to forgive. He is strong enough to lay his life down for those he loves. And I pray that you can have a really blessed Christmas. And you know what? I think that he must have an amazing sense of humor when I think of all the wonderful things around that can just make you laugh with joy. And he has such compassion. And he will share in our sorrows and walk with us and he'll share our joys. Well, God bless you guys. I pray that you have a great day. I better let you get going and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I'm going to share very quickly, just a little bit, because it was requested. And then um, I'll get going. And have a great Christmas. Merry Christmas. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright,
Just listen to these words. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from Thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at Thy birth. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Merry Christmas. I love you guys, and I will see you next time.